that's going to be more practical than anything else for us. So let's say we have 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 7x minus 1. That's our first polynomial. Plus 4x squared minus 2x plus 6. That's our second polynomial. So here, is there any reason that those, uh, those parentheses need to be there? Since we're just adding, the parentheses don't really indicate anything for us, so we can just kind of ignore them. So what this really boils down to then is just combining like terms. So when we add monomial pieces, what makes them like terms is that the variable parts are the same. So for example, negative 2x squared and 4x squared are like terms because their variable parts are the same. 7x and negative 2x are like terms because their variable parts are the same. And negative 1 and positive 6 are like terms because their variable parts are the same. So the 3x cubed doesn't change because it doesn't have any like term to combine with. When I add negative 2x squared and 4x squared, we add their coefficients. So negative 2 plus 4 is 2. And the variable part stays exactly the same. So 7x minus 2x, 7 minus 2 is 5, and then the x stays the same. And then negative 1 plus 6 is 5. Everybody cool with that? Pretty stinking easy, right? Next up is subtraction. So I'm just going to take the exact same polynomial. And this time we're going to do subtraction. Now here, subtraction, the parentheses, does matter for one of these two polynomials. The parentheses need to be there for the second polynomial because that subtraction, or that negative sign, kind of distributes through that whole polynomial. And after I've distributed that through, I can now treat this the same way I did as an addition problem. So I can just combine my like terms. So the only difference there for subtraction is we have to make sure that we distribute that negative sign through. But after we've done that, we can treat this just the same as the addition problem. and just combine like terms. So far, so good. Again, nothing tricky going on here, right? Pretty standard looking. Nothing, hopefully, very surprising. That's all very good. Well, yes, sir. Of course. Uh huh. Multiplication things tend to or start getting a little bit more complicated, but still fairly manageable. So let's say we're going to multiply these two polynomials. Well, this is, looks pretty similar to a skill that we're already familiar with called FOIL, right? When we multiply two binomials together. 
We could think about this as kind of the same idea where I can just multiply every term in the first polynomial to every term in the second polynomial. The drawback of thinking about it this way it's just kind of an information management situation is that there's a lot of little multiplication problems and a lot of results to kind of deal with. And the combining of like terms at the end gets a little bit uh, inconvenient maybe because you have to like search through to find them and it's just kind of a hassle. Um, what I prefer to do is just like a different management of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build out a grid and I'm gonna do this multiplication in the grid and that grid will help me keep track of the like terms and also make sure that I've kind of make it easier to make sure I remember to do all of the multiplications and everything else. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of the two polynomials and I'm gonna write it as columns. So I'm gonna use that first polynomial and I'm just gonna write it as columns. Now notice here that I'm going to do something. Notice this first polynomial goes from x to the fourth, x to the third, to x to the first, but we don't have any x squareds. I'm gonna leave a column for those x squareds. I'm just gonna call that column zero x squareds. You don't really have to do that, but you lose a lot of the benefits of the organization if you omit doing that, because then all of a sudden the like terms don't line up exactly the same way which is the major benefit of doing the problem this way. And then I'm gonna use the second polynomial to make my rows. Everybody so far so good? So there's my grid. Now, each of these boxes inside my grid represents one small multiplication problem. So this first box is going to represent x squared times 3x to the fourth. So when I multiply two monomials together, we multiply their coefficients together. So 3 times 1 is 3. And then we multiply their variable parts together. When we multiply variables, though, we add the exponents. So x squared times x to the fourth is x to the sixth. If you were unsure of why we're adding exponents when we multiply, remember the definition for exponents. So x squared is x times x, and x to the fourth is x times x times x times x. So x squared times x to the fourth is six x's multiplied together which is x to the sixth, right? So that's why we're adding those exponents, just as a reminder. And now I'm just gonna fill in the rest of this quickly. Everybody's okay with me kind of buzzing through that part here. While I'm doing this, watch out for some of the neat patterns that are emerging when you look at the exponents on our variables, we get some nice patterns emerging. That part down there is just an aside. I'm going to. That was me talking about something a little off topic as like a little review thing. So I'm just going to make a note of that so that if you go back and look at my notes, you're not confused about like what the heck is that coming from. So notice the patterns going on in our table here. If we look down the columns, the degrees are going down by one each time, right? The exponents on our variables. If you look across the rows, the exponents are going down by one each time. And the best part here is if we look at the like terms, they're all lining up on diagonals. 
So I don't have to do a lot of hunting to locate my like terms. I just have to look along the diagonals, right? So it's really convenient um, kind of using this approach. While it requires a little bit of extra writing maybe in the beginning to set this up or a little extra space on your sheet of paper, what's really lovely about it is that it's really hard to forget to do one of these, multiple, these little multiplication problems. And then when it's time to collect your like terms, there's nothing really to collect, right? They're already organized for us on these diagonals, which is pretty convenient. You know what I mean? Yes? That, oh, I just put zero in front. Well, the reason I did that is notice that there's no x squared term in this problem. And in order for the like terms to line up correctly, I need to put that 0x squared in there so that I have those zeros or else the diagonals won't line up. And I lose a lot of the advantage of doing it this way. So that's why I included that 0 there. So if there's no x in like the problem, we could just calculate the 0 thing? Well, again, I, I want to be clear. You don't have to. Right? Like it doesn't change how the outcome, how the problem is done or what answer you'll get. What it does change is if you're building this grid, your like terms won't line up on diagonal, so you have to like hunt and peck through the to find all your like terms, and you lose some of the advantage of everything lining up nicely. So you won't get the wrong answer per se, but it doesn't it makes the problem you lose some of the benefit of doing the problem that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So just wanting to be clear there. It's not a, you won't get the wrong answer if you omit doing that. Okay. Um, next up is division. So this is the, of the four operations, this one is the one that's the trickiest. And before we start doing a polynomial division problem, what I want to do is go back and review long division because it's a basically the same procedure. So let's say we have 1,247 divided by 24 or something. So remember, uh, just a little bit of vocabulary, this first number is called the dividend, and this second number is called the divisor. And the answer we get will have a quotient and then plus a fraction, a remainder, over the divisor. So that's just kind of, when we do a long division problem, that's kind of, oops, from a vocabulary standpoint, kind of what's going on. Um, to set up one of these long division problems, we put the divisor on the outside of our division bar and the dividend goes underneath it, right? And we just kind of go and see how many times does 24 go in digit by digit. So how many times does 24 go into 1? Well, 0, it doesn't. How many times does 24 go into 12? 0, it doesn't. How many times does 24 go into 124? Well, that's 5 times. So 5 times 124 is 120, and then we'll subtract down, and then bring our next digit down, and then we'll ask, okay, how many times does 24 go into 47? Well, just once. So 1 times 24 is 24, we subtract down and we're left with a remainder of 23. So we'd say our quotient is 51 plus our remainder over our divisor. So we have our answer being like 51 and 23 over 24. Everybody kind of remember doing that? It might have been like the way we formatted our answer might have been a little bit different than you did in like late elementary, early middle school. But the process, that long division process should look reasonably familiar. So if we do this now with a polynomial, 
Let's see what that looks like. So we'll start with, say, x squared minus 7x plus 6 divided by x minus 1. So the way we set up the problem is exactly the same. So the divisor goes on the outside, and the dividend goes underneath that division bar. But one way that this process is going to differ than the division we were doing before is the only thing we care about on each of these steps is the leading coefficients. So I'm going to ask myself what times x gives me x squared? Well, the answer to that question is just x, right? So I'm going to multiply x to the entire divisor and write the answer underneath and subtract down. Everybody's okay with that? Now, the most common place I see students make mistakes on this problem is remembering to distribute this negative. So before we do our subtraction, we need to make sure we distribute this negative. So when it distributes to the x squared, I get a negative x squared. When it distributes to the negative x, it becomes a positive x. And now I'm going to get rid of the parentheses because I distributed the negative 2. So now I can just go and do this um, digit by digit. So x squared minus x squared is 0. Negative x plus, or negative 7x plus x is negative 6x. And then I'll bring that last piece down. And then I'll ask myself, OK, what times x gives me negative 6x? Well, that's easy. That's just going to be negative 6. So I'll multiply that to both parts of my divisor. So ne uh, negative 6 times x is negative 6. And negative 6 times negative 1 is positive 6. And then we'll subtract down. Before I do that subtraction, let's distribute our negative. So negative of a negative is positive. And negative of a positive is negative. So negative 6 x plus 6x is 0, and 6 minus 6 is 0, so our answer is remainder 0. So we don't really need to include that other fraction part at the end because the remainder is 0, and then 0 over whatever is just 0 and it goes away. Let's do another one of those, right? That process is not trivial, especially if you're seeing it for the first time, like the people from um, Miss Morgan's classes would be. I mean, we did this a little bit at the end of the year, but if you're like, yo, I kind of checked out at the end of the year, I don't really remember this, that's okay too, since we're doing it again. So let's do another one. Actually, hold on a second. I'm going to do that. Okay, so we have x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2 divided by x squared minus x plus 1. Now there is one very important difference between this example and the previous example. Now obviously the number of terms is different, the degrees are different, but there's something else going on here as well. Notice in our dividend, we go from x squared, or x to the fourths, to x squared. We're missing an x cubed. And we go from x squared to constant terms. We're missing an x. 
you must include those in this or else you're going to make a big old mess out of this problem. So when we write our setup, again, divisor goes on the outside. And then I want to make sure I include those zeros. Or else this really becomes messy and difficult, and it's very unlikely you'd get through it. Um, for a process that's already a little bit tricky, to forget those zeros really makes it tough to adapt and recover if you forget to do that. So it's really critically important on these problems that you include them. OK. Uh, so we'll begin by asking ourselves, what times x squared gives me x to the fourth? x squared, right? Very good. So I had to multiply that to the entire divisor, and I'm going to write my answer underneath, and we'll subtract down. So far, so good. Remember to distribute our negative. So that becomes negative x to the fourth, positive x cubed, negative x squared. So when we go add down x to the fourth minus x to the fourth is zero. Zero x cubed plus x cubed is x cubed. Negative 3x squared minus x squared is negative 4x squared. And then we'll bring down the next piece and go back to the top. And ask ourselves what times x squared gives me x to the third. Well, that's easy. It's just x, right? So multiply that to the whole divisor. and then subtract down. Again, before we start doing that, let's distribute our negative. So negative of a positive is negative. Negative of a negative is positive. Negative of a positive is negative. x cubed minus x cubed is 0. x to the fourth, or I'm sorry, negative 4x squared plus x squared is negative 3x squared. 0x minus x is negative x. And then we'll bring down that last piece. This will be our last step. I can tell because I've now brought down everything from the original problem. So anything left over at this point would be, or after this step, would be a part of my remainder. So I'll ask myself, what times x squared gives me negative 3x squared? Well, that's negative 3. So I'll distribute through, so negative 3x squared plus 3x minus 3. We'll subtract. Before we start our subtraction, let's distribute that negative. So negative of a negative is positive. Negative of a positive is negative. Negative of a negative is positive. So Th or negative 3x squared plus 3x squared is 0. Negative x minus 3x is negative 4x. And 2 plus 3 is 5. So that part is my remainder then. So the way we'll write our final answer would be x squared plus x minus 3 plus my remainder, negative 4x plus 5 over my divisor, which is x squared minus x plus 1. Okay. So I know that's tricky, right? It's, it's a long process. But hopefully we've done enough practice here and done enough example that 
with going back and looking at your notes or possibly watching this little section of the video, you could make your way through this, right? We have one last topic to talk about today. That last topic is called synthetic substitution. But before we do that, let's talk about just substitution. So if I have some polynomial, and I want to do, say, f of negative 2, what does that really mean? Well, it means that I'm going to plug negative 2 in for all of the x's. and just kind of evaluate, right? So the answer to this is 37. Now there's another way of doing this, same process, called synthetic substitution. So in synthetic substitution, the number that we're plugging in we're going to write on the outside of our setup. And the coefficients of the polynomial that we're plugging into are going to go inside this little setup. That's what the setup looks like. The first step is to just take the very first number and bring it down. The next step is we're going to take this number on the outside, multiply it by the number underneath, and write our answer in that next spot and then add down. And we're going to keep repeating that process then until all of our spaces are filled. So now I'll take negative 2, multiply it to negative 16, write that answer in the next spot, and then add down. And when you're at that final spot, the number under the bar is our answer. Notice it matches what we got here. And you might be asking me, good Lord, Mr. Kulik, that is a complicated, for, stupid process for doing something that was already pretty easy. I'd say, yeah, you're right. Um, and in general, we're not going to use this process to do substitution, but we can adapt this substitution process to do things that are not trivial and easy. And that's kind of the point of doing this. So this is just a stepping off point to adapt this process to do something that's actually going to be a big shortcut for us. Um, so let's do one more example of that real quick. Um, oops. So let's say we have the polynomial 3x cubed minus 2x plus 5, and we want to find f of negative 3. So negative 3 is going to go on the outside of my setup. And the numbers that go on the inside, again, there's a critical difference between this example and the previous one. Notice there are no x squareds. So we're going to need to make sure we put a 0 there in the x squared spot. It is critically important 
that you remember to include that zero there. You will not be able to get the right answer if you do not include the zero there. Not like, oh, I'll just figure it out, and like I can rejigger how things line up and make it work, like you could conceivably do with the division. If you don't put that zero there, there is no recovery from it. You will get the wrong answer. Gotta have it. All right, so we bring the first number down. Outside number times the bottom number. Write it in the next spot and add down. Outside number times the bottom number. Write it in the next spot, add down. Outside number times the bottom number. Write it in the next spot, add down. So our answer is negative 70. Okie dokie. Your homework assignment for the homework check on Sunday is here in the content library. It's called Chapter 5, Homework Version 2. So those of you that are in my class did like a different version of this same homework assignment already last semester. I've obviously changed some of the numbers in the problem, so it's a decidedly different homework problem, although the same kinds of questions and same types of questions. So for number one, I give you these three polynomials and ask you to list the degree of the polynomial, the number of terms, leading term, leading coefficient, constant term for each of them. In two through four, we're asking you to add two of them, subtract two of them, multiply two of them. In five, six, and seven, we're asking you to do some synthetic substitution on each of them. And in 8, 9, and 10, I give you two polynomials that we're going to be dividing. So doing the exact same skills that we did today in class and practice, your notes will be quite helpful for you on this homework assignment. Um, this will be, along with your syllabus sign-in sheet, will be part of your homework check on Sunday. So when you do this, um, whether you do it on one note or on a separate sheet of paper, eventually it's got to end up in one note. Um, make sure that once you've finished everything you've done for your homework, that before you close OneNote, you sync your notebook. So if you take the drop down, you right click in there and pick sync this notebook now and see how the little green arrows are going there. Once that stops, your notebook is synced and you can shut OneNote down and go on about your day. But make sure that you sync your notebook. We had lots of problems first semester with people forgetting to sync. Okay, doke. Thanks, guys.